When I was, uh, I think it was 16 years old, I got my first real job, other than a paper route or babysitting, working at a print shop, not that one, not that long ago, <laughs> called Abso Blueprints in Etobicoke, just west of Toronto. And my neighbor was the manager of the store, so he offered us a summer job. It turned into a year-round job. And I was so keen uh, to have this first experience of a real job. And I remember when I got there, and we'd be making blueprints through these big machines and, and just basically trying to improve production and jobs would come in the front door and we'd have to get them done fast and get them out. And as a 16-year-old keener, I was, I had to get faster results than anyone else. I was so uh, desirous of being a good employee and doing a good job that every time I went there, my printing rate went up, my production weight, my, my trimming rate, whatever needed to be done, I was doing faster and faster and faster and faster than all the other people who'd worked there for years. So I was pretty proud of myself for that. They hated me. Um, but all I wanted to do was do well. and. Uh, Looking back now, right, so that I knew I was somebody, right, and that I, I, I had something to contribute and, and I mattered. And so one day, um, another guy who works with me um, joined after I did, uh, 10 years older than I was, Alfie. Um, after about three months of he and I working side by side, I hear that Alfie gets a raise from Abso, $1.50 an hour. And I think, oh, that's great. I can hardly wait to get called into the office for my raise. They're probably getting Alfie done first and then bring me in. And then for the next several days, crickets, nothing, no raise coming for John. So finally, I go into the office of my boss, Gord Brown, and say, what's up? Here's Alfie, who's an okay employee, but he's not producing like I'm producing. And here you give him a raise of a buck fifty an hour, and I've been here longer than him and do much more than he does. What is up? And so he, uh, in retrospect, instead of firing me right on the spot, says, John, Alfie lives on his own. He pays rent. He lives with his mom, and he has to support her. And he needs a, a higher salary so that he can have a life. You're living at home. You're in school. And... If we can help Alfie out, we're going to help Alfie out. Now get out of my office. And so I left his office totally shaken by the fact that I was the kind of person that deserved that kind of rebuke, that I was so self-absorbed in what I was doing in my good work in life that I couldn't see a grace like that for what it was. And I wonder if the hardworking characters in Jesus' parable of the laborers ever felt the same way. God's kingdom, Jesus said, is like an estate manager who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. They agreed on a wage of a dollar a day and went to work. Later, about 9 o'clock, the manager saw some other men hanging around the town square, unemployed. And he told them to go and work in his vineyard, and he would pay them a fair wage. They went. He did the same thing at noon and again at 3 o'clock. At 5 o'clock, he went back and still found others standing around. And he said, why are you standing around all day doing nothing? And they said, because no one hired us. And he told them, to go work in his vineyard. When the day's work was over, the owner of the vineyard instructed his foreman, call the workers in and pay them their wages. Start with the last hired and go on to the first. Those hired at five o'clock came up and were each given a dollar. When those who were hired first saw that, they assumed they would be getting far more. But they got the same, each of them, one dollar. And taking the dollar, they groused angrily to the manager. These last workers put in only one easy hour, and you just made them equal to us, who slaved all day under the, a scorching sun. And he replied to the one speaking for the rest, 
Friend, I haven't been unfair. We agreed on the wage of a dollar, didn't we? So take it and go. I decided to give to the one who came last the same as you. Can't I do what I want with my own money? Are you going to get stingy because I'm generous? And then Jesus adds this parenthetical comment. Here it is again, the great reversal. Many of the first ending up last, and the last first. So have you ever felt that kind of resentment when someone in your class, it's usually someone who's a peer or close to you, a family member, a friend, someone in your class gets an unfair break or the newbie at work gets promoted past you, or once again that friend of yours to whom life always seems to come so easy and so beautifully, it happens again or someone cuts in line, just not the way the world is supposed to be, right? Or is it? I mean, according to this parable and Jesus, things in the kingdom of God, His world, are sometimes, maybe often that way. Maybe more often than not, certainly more often than we're comfortable with. When it comes to the kingdom of God, things are backwards and upside down, inside out. And when Jesus tells a parable like this, to them back then, to us, you, right now, it's meant to turn your, this foundational, we don't even question it, concept of merit-based reward on its head. And Jesus, in telling it, exposes your and my merit-based, works-based blind spots. Apparently, equal pay for equal work is not the way things work with God. Thank God. And God seems to be the kind of God who plays, pays slackers for a full day's work. And were you to complain to God about the unfairness of this, I'm sure he would say the same thing to you that he said to them, Heather, I haven't been unfair we agreed on the wage of a dollar, didn't we? So take it and go. I decided to give to the one who came last, the same as you. Can't I do what I want with my own money? With my own love, with my own gifts, with my own salvation? Are you going to get stingy because I'm so generous? And then something inside of me goes, yes, I am. <laughs> Because it is not fair, God. This is an Achilles heel in me. It comes up still at 55 all the time. It's more polite than, it's not fair, but it's there. I've done everything you've asked of me. I've behaved as best I could, did the work you wanted, took the call, did what you asked me to do, God, and this is how I'm rewarded? Are you telling us, God, that behavior doesn't matter to you? I mean, surely not, because it does. It says in the Bible, you said it yourself, be holy as I am holy. And then I imagine Jesus responding to me with a kind of gentleness like my boss had. Yeah, what you do does matter. Of course it matters. All the workers in that story worked. But the way you calculate the value of my work is the problem of your work. I want you to do your best, but the moment you think your best is good enough or your best is in some way meriting what I'm going to give you, you're in trouble. The, the risk of good behavior and effort and performance is that you might be tempted to think you've earned your reward, earned your salvation have to keep earning it to keep it, your pay. And the moment you're there, you are on the edge of a precipice, risking a very big fall. 
So Jesus tells a parable like this and many others to upend us and teach us that the kingdom doesn't work that way and God's love doesn't work that way. God's kingdom has lots of room for low-end performers, the least, the last, the lost, and the losers in this world. So you hear a parable like that, and it kind of begs the question. It does in me. Then, Is this what Christian faith is to me? Is this the kind of understanding of salvation and God and grace and works that I live with? Is it a, or is Christian faith just a good, moral, and upright way to do a life or just a good ethical community that does some service overseas and has a cool vision? Or maybe it's just a safe place from this depraved and secular world. Or is it a place that by the grace of God, your sorry butt ended up because he was willing to love you and f- in spite of the fact that you were so screwed up and had it all wrong and upside down and so needed help and were so desperate and had no idea, and yet he reached out and included you. Jesus told this parable in part to a bunch of hyper-religious Pharisees, high rollers who were clearly high on themselves, who figured that Keeping the law was a huge part of earning and keeping your salvation, your reward with God. And so for them to hear these words, it would have been a total affront. But to the other people in the crowd, maybe hanging around the outside edges or just within earshot who didn't feel they maybe even deserved to be there, when they heard this, it was hope. It was a place for me. They would have laughed out loud and maybe wondered, who is this guy? Because he just said that and he's not laughing and he believes it and I believe him. And then maybe a tear comes to your eye and you go, could could that be true? Could a person like me be loved by God in that kind of way? A full day's pay. And the question, again, becomes, who are you in the crowd? Or some in between those two extremes, person. Those who think they're first or those who know they're last? And then I hear the whisper in me, John, every time you wince at someone receiving an unmerited gift or a, a grace or getting a freebie or enjoying life when you work so hard at your job, You are answering that question. And this is in me. And so far, I cannot extricate it from my life. This is who we innately are. Works-based, self-righteous. We will earn our way to God or live our lives as though that's true people. We forget, I forget, which always reminds me of how the Apostle Paul, he must have written these next words because he had to help remind himself not to forget. Saint Paul didn't forget when he writes this. We couldn't carry this being saved by God thing off by our own efforts, and we know it. Even though we can list what many might think are impressive credentials, You know my pedigree, he writes, a legitimate birth, circumcised on the eighth day, an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin, a strict and devout adherent to God's law, a fiery defender of the purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting the church, a meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book. The very credentials these people are waving around as something special, I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash, along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared with the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master, firsthand, 
Everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant, dog dung. Paul actually used the S word there. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. I gave up all that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, and go all the way with him to death itself if there was any way to get in on the resurrection from the dead. He didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness, self-supply, that comes from keeping a list of rules when he could get the robust kind of righteousness that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. And how are those two different? Well, Christ's righteousness, God's, instead of being meager and impotent and short-lived, is overflowing, life-changing, and eternal in its nature. Instead of being a mortal you thing that you produce, it's a heavenly gifted thing that God produces, so it should feel like a miracle that that would be at work in your or my life. And instead, connected to the parable of being something you've earned or deserved, it is freely given and received through humility and tears. It's everything given to you for nothing. And that's what Christ's message is. The good news, I'll give you everything for free. I'll give you me. And you'll know me personally. And you'll know God. And you'll suffer with me and you'll know the power of my salvation and resurrection, and you'll have a life. It's it's like a bunch of last hired one-hour working workers getting a full day's pay. It's like blind and deaf people who could never have possibly saved themselves or healed themselves, miraculously seeing and hearing again. It's like a smart-mouthed, self-filled, self-righteous, egocentric teenager slash 55-year-old being called to be a minister in the church and speak for God. It's like him or, or you. Are you guys on that table, really? Being included, being paid a full day's pay and being given life, eternal life. Here it is again, Jesus said, the great reversal, many of the first ending up last and the last first. One of my favorite theologians, evidently one of Pastor Rich's too, and you don't preach a parable without quoting Robert Farrar Capon, commenting on this parable, makes some very hard-hitting observations. He says that in this parable, Judgment falls not on the unacceptable, but only on those who will not accept acceptance. Bookkeeping is the only punishable offense in the kingdom of heaven, he writes. And then the hardest hitting, hell is reserved for those idiots who insist on keeping non-existent records in their heads. How can I be so stingy with God when, with my love, with my grace, when God has been so generous to me? And as I said at the beginning of the service, I think we need to grasp, I need to grasp this again. And we've got a cool vision and a neat calling and a charism that God's given our church and I am more excited about that than ever, but if it's not born out of grace, of this incredulity at the love of God, an ever-present sense of 
being lavished upon and held and accepted by God. If we're not a community within which that is flowing, then it's going to go nowhere. I always think when I need to be humbled and learn that performance doesn't matter, always think about my downy boy son, Edward, who, as I thought about him this week, rarely defines himself by his performance, at least not in a so-I-have-value kind of way. He does good things out of such a freedom and awareness of self and never does that kind of works-based math. I don't think it ever crosses his mind that he'd be loved more for being good or loved less if he fell short. And he rarely fights to be first. I've, he's never said it's not fair or even communicated that kind of a sentiment in my memory. So when we go swimming at the Clarney Pool and there's kids all lining up for the diving board and he's just, I, mean, I watch from the hot tub. I watch from the hot tub. <laughs> uh, and I'm projecting on him, cut in line. You were there first. Don't let that little kid, that kid's littler than you. They, they got out four jumps ago. Don't let them pass you. And Edward just kind of, and they all, and then finally there's one kid, often a little girl, half Edward's age, who will look at him and kind of just signal to him that it's his turn. And he goes, okay, and he gets in and he does his crazy jump. And I think, that's the kingdom of God. That's who I ought to be. The kind of person who puts others first so much that lives into a grace that evokes something in another, a kind of grace that creates that kind of a story, that kind of a letting in, that kind of a life. Surely it's with that kind of heart that people, that Jesus saw those people that he told this parable to back then gathered around him, and it's surely with that kind of heart that God sees you right now. Be holy as I am holy, but the way God is holy is gracious. So God is perfect, and perfect in terms of this ridiculous love for people who don't deserve it. So, there again, the great reversal, people. Many of you first, ending up last, and I trust and pray many of us last, ending up first. Let's pray. So, Lord, let the, uh, these your words uh, dwell in us, um, stick to us. Help us to uh, be reminded of them by your Spirit, this parable you spoke, you speak, this grace you are and you are. Help us to uh, hear it as directly and intimately and personally as we ought, as we can, as you invite us to hear it. Like someone in the crowd who all of a sudden your eyes are moving around and eye contact happens and we know it and you know it. And we know this is meant for us and that kind of love and that kind of grace and that kind of life is meant for us. And we know it feelings so seen and loved and uh, accepted despite uh, messing up all the time. May that moment be everyone's moment in this place, in your world, because we're meant for life. We're meant to be clothed anew with, with your righteousness and seen as perfect because of your perfection. 
Help that to happen for each of us and for all of us here. So that your name might be honored, so that your grace would be paid forward and go forth, and so that we wouldn't be such freaks about performance and fairness and the worst sense of the word and all the things that inordinately take up our energies, but that instead we would be known as people who love in ridiculous ways and just stand back and let others go first and celebrate with those who who luck out and who get a beauty and a grace in their lives. May that be more and more what identifies and uh, is who we are as a community. Who I am and who each of us is in this community. This we pray, Lord, in your name and in the name of our Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen.